but I'm not going to start until spot on because we're still um, two minutes to go. So um, we can start in a minute. Yeah. Just wanted to check. You can still hear me, right, Peter? Yeah, absolutely fine. <laughs> Good. So, um, good, we're going to start in one minute. So, welcome to all the audience, the participants. Uh, I'll be starting in a few seconds. Right, so a good afternoon and a warm welcome from Switzerland. Um, welcome to the panelists who are here all gathered. Uh, so far, everything works fine technically. And welcome to the audience, to you all here. You'll have a chance to engage later through the chat. This panel discussion looks at not really so much the challenges, but more the opportunities for startups and how they can deal with those current challenges that we're going through with the COVID virus. And until recently, we all know that startups and entrepreneurship was really a face-to-face -face activity. Until recently, also many of these entrepreneurs and startups they were congregating at events um, and in hubs. They were working, meeting, learning, and collaborating. But now things are different. And our panel uh, amongst our excellent panel we have representation from actually six different countries first of all i'll introduce the panelists in a minute but we have japan we have the philippines we have the uk we have france and we have iceland and you saw a few people waving there from those respective countries i'm going to briefly now introduce our panelists our experts who have got a very large breadth and depth of knowledge on this topic of startups. Um, first of all, it's my top, my, my right hand side, Miss Ivy uh, Ruth Inagoda. Um, she is actually the co founder of Synergistic Technologies Corporation, as we said, based in the Philippines. It's a startup tech company, and they promote custom software and mobile application services, and they're dedicated to helping their clients give the best experience to their customers as they interact with their brand. As well as that, Ivy Ruth is also a founder of an online remote freelancer uh, organization in the Philippines. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization, and she promotes work at home for Filipinos. Next to her, um, just on her, right or sorry my right and her left we have mr yoshiki sasaki he's the based in japan actually he's the ceo uh, and the founder of strategic capital and human life management in japan very well-known company and he's got significant experience in helping japanese com companies and technologies to go global uh, and also he's very much focused on introducing global companies and technologies from other companies into Japan. So a two-way process there, Mr. Yoshiki Sasaki. Below, um, actually below me on my screen, we have Ms. Uh, Lisbeth Peters. She's actually um, been active in investing and impact investing for 15 years. And she's been focused on assisting capital flows for impact and a stress impact to emerging markets. She runs a team of 25 young professionals based across London, but also Nairobi and Washington. It'd be interesting to hear later about how those teams operate. And she's focusing, or the team's focus on market research, 
on business appraisals and investment structuring of impact products and impact management. And she's also very uh, much engaged with gender equality, healthcare and education. So Ms. Elizabeth Peters, next to, on her right, or sorry, my right on her left is Mr. Ragnar Sikordsson. He's based in Iceland and we we're just sort of joking how uh, because of um, uh, lockdown, or not lockdown, but because of quarantine, he's pretty much stuck there. But he is actually the co-founder and CEO of Aware Go. And this is a cybersecurity awareness company, um, which was established in 2007. And up until 2017, it was just him and his wife. Uh, but since then, they've been growing extremely fast. And now they have 25. Um, team members, team 25 on the team, with, all, with offices in Iceland, the US, the Czech Republic, and also six other countries. And maybe we can hear about that in a moment. So Mr. Ragnar Sikudsen from Iceland. And finally, uh, bottom right for me, might be different to you, Mr. Ben Costantini. Um, he's actually had many years of experience, more than 10 years of experience in the event industry, which is a fascinating topic, of course, when we're talking virtually. He's been working with large B2B international conferences, and by big, we mean very big, international conferences and fairs. And he runs his organization, Startup Sesame, and a network of tech events. They're a team, a small team of 10 people. They're in Paris. Um, and they're remote working with startups, with investors, with corporations, with speakers, and event organizers and public entities in very different ways, which we'll hear more about. And also, he's very much focused on not only Europe, but Asia as well. So I'm going to start off um, actually maybe with Ben, because, you know, we've heard a lot about the event industry. and um, we all used to be in a face in face to face context. Um, but Ben, you're the founder and CEO of Startup Sesame. Um, how do you see the opportunities then in terms of opportunities for startups? Are we really going through a crisis here or are there opportunities also in this homework mode? Over to you, Ben. Sure. Thank you, Peter. Uh, it's actually a trick we tricky question there's not a one fit all you know answer um for, for some of them it was very bad uh and it still is and for others it's good and also very good um and a, a good thing that most of the panelists would i i think would agree upon is that uh startup can really pivot quickly um that's what a lot of the companies did uh, after some weeks in lockdown here in europe in particular um, for example, you can mention, you can think of companies working in the retail space and that shifted quickly to, uh, click and collect solutions. They managed to grow their revenues faster, like a lot faster than what they were doing before the crisis. And that happened in a very short amount of time. So from May onwards, they could report, uh, like great numbers, uh, to their uh, investors and, 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 and to their teams. Uh, a lot of other, you know, um, sectors where we've witnessed acceleration of digitalization uh, will be health, education, HR. So there's a lot of opportunities in that space. Um, in our even even in our case, um, without going too much into details of what we do and not selling, you know, my company here, we did have to pivot. Uh, we we like a lot of our work relies on physical gatherings, and we've been building technology for that purpose internally with our developers and so on. And because of, you know, the shift to online events, we had to rethink what we would what we would do. And I would say it took us longer than uh, a regular startup could do. Um but we, we made it uh and uh, and we're pretty satisfied with it. So I can tell you more about it in another moment. Another thing I'd like to say more specifically about work from home, um I think you know like we all think that it's easier or it's easy for startups um, to do that. Like you think of, you know, startup people working on their laptop in a coffee, you know, co-working space. But the reality is that you want to keep in mind that startups are just regular companies uh, down the line. 
they, they, they experiment with new business models, often with technologies. But like any other company, most of the teams start really like a decline of productivity. Um, and they still need face to face interaction. Um, in our case, um, we, we decided to move quickly to, to, to a remote setup. It was easy in a sense because a lot of the work we do doesn't rely on uh, gathering physically, as I was saying before. Uh, but we try to, you know, find times to gather, to come together, uh, you know, for activities, lunch, stuff like that. Uh, but it's also opening opportunities in terms of uh, HR. So we can, you know, um, we are more prepared to hire and involve people internationally. We're already doing this, but for very short, you know, terms like freelancing jobs and stuff. But now we're really capable of having team members that are not based here in France. Um, another quick one, and that will be the end for, for me for this introduction, you know, uh, part. Um, we, when I mentioned the pivot that we did, um, basically, we went out and interviewed people in our community. We did a survey. We went, you know, like so many companies did that, like you might have received surveys from people telling you, okay, what do you want from us? How can we adjust, you know, what we're doing for you? And we did something similar um, over the summer and uh, that helped, you know, a lot. So we could, you know, gather a lot of insights. And what is super interesting and I, I like to share is that now planning is not a problem. So back in the good old days of face-to-face -face events, you would really need to decide, you know, cleverly what you want to do with your time and which, you know, uh, events you will attend, the resources like time, uh, the cost of, you know, traveling there, all the investment that it would require uh, was kind of a problem for a lot of companies, especially startups. And that's one of the reasons why we created our, uh, the company uh, at the beginning. Uh, now you can, you know, decide in the morning to join Oasis, you know, uh, extraordinary meeting. And um, in the afternoon, you could be, you know, joining a demo day in, I don't know, uh, New York, right? So, so that is not a problem anymore. The problem is that the choice is harder than ever because there's so many events, like there was already a lot. But now it's like even, you know, 10 times, you know, more. There's a lot of hidden events that are just Zoom, you know, links. Where do you mm. find them, et cetera? So like we, 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 we learned by doing this survey, this, you know, this research over the summer that people are actually willing to pay for this type of, you know, information, for curation, for recommendation, and they need events. Like it's like they, they, they still need this. Um, and especially now that they can do it from home, you see that there is a, a need for better events. Um, and also we see that people are eager to come back. You know. Thank that you. will be uh, a first point, you know. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So touching on the quality aspect, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of an overload of um, virtual events. Now, Ragnar, um, you're actually involved with your company. You're the CEO and founder of co-founder of Aware Go. Um, how does it look like for you there in Iceland? Um, have there been significant opportunities created through this home working mode? Yeah, uh, like for us, uh, business is uh, booming. Uh, lucky I'm not in tourism at least, yeah. but uh, uh, working from home uh, opens up uh, a brand new box. Of, uh, it's a Pandora's box of uh, threats and risks that uh, are uh, being uh, uh, exposed. Uh, like, uh, like for instance, if you if you're working in your company, you are in most cases uh, uh, pretty uh, secure behind the company firewalls and, and such. But uh, working from home opens up uh, a lot of other, like your own personal firewall is probably not as good as the, the company one. And the uh, the uh, uh, your kids and friends of your kids are might be uh, messing around in your computer and, uh, and also just uh, uh, like, uh, I used to be working as a penetration tester, and one of my favorite method was uh, uh, just uh, finding the people's home and uh, going there and hacking the uh, Wi-Fi and uh, to get that way into into the computers. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a new box of uh, of risks that uh, need to be handled. Thank you, and um, so opportunities there. Uh, 
Also, um, security, of course, a very important part, people working from home. Uh, maybe we can come back and touch on other aspects today with that. Lisbeth, um, also your um, experience as managing partner at Volta Capital, um, maybe you could comment generally on opportunities for working at home, working from home. Yeah, I think I um, would like to build on a, a few items that other um, panelists already you know, like mentioned, you know, like everything is a, a challenge and an opportunity. Um, and I think that the you know, like the flexibility that people have experienced in being able to manage their work life uh, differently, um, obviously, at first came with a big challenge, um, but it has also opened up uh, one uh, opportunities for, for example, uh, female workers uh, that tend to traditionally be more responsible for the childcare uh, and the homeschooling. Um, and what we've definitely seen an uptake in shared responsibilities um, of domestic work. And so, for example, in like uh, the impact investing space and around gender equality, domestic work, you know, like it's non-remunerated and it's one form of sort of like hidden uh, burden, you know, like on the on the female gender. So I think that's been really um, an opportunity. Um, the uh, other opportunity or the, the, the thing that we have seen in, in terms of how startups and smaller companies, you know, like have adapted is to go uh, more for a community based internal leadership. Um, so, you know, like the, the hierarchy of the organization all of a sudden breaks down uh, because the CEO, you know, like has their three year old running into, you know, like the video and somebody's cat walks around and, you know, like somebody's making dinner, you know, like while still on a conference call. Um, so it, 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 it has meant that organizations, I think, and especially startups, you know, like are more geared towards creating effective teams. And it doesn't matter, you know, like what your title or your role is, you know, like you sort of like step up and you do, you know, like what you're looking to do with your team. And we've definitely witnessed that. I think the last thing that I would say is that we've seen a lot of um, adapting of what used to be like physical tools, you know, like um, into a different context um, and digital, you know, like has played a very big role in that. And I'm sure we'll come back to that later on. Thank you. Um, maybe I could introduce Ivy into that point. I, I think we lost you for a few seconds, but um, there was a strong focus from Elizabeth on um, female workers and opportunities for females. And you're working in the Philippines, Ivy. Um, what is the situation there? Could you maybe expand a little bit on opportunities there for home-based workers and particularly females? Yeah, there's actually a lot of transitioning going on here in the Philippines, especially with the ongoing pandemic. So right now, a lot of businesses and even startups are actually trying to grasp in how they can actually transition online. So majority of the business right now, especially with um, food industry and as well as with the um, tourism, are actually already uh, transitioning digitally. And they're trying to see on how they can actually, you know, um, promote their business uh, through the online platform. So as well as with the female freelancers right now, a lot of um, BPO workers or a lot of um, Filipinos, especially not as well as with females, as well as with, the, with men, they're trying to, you know, find ways in transitioning to free, uh, freelancing. So a lot of platforms can be found, um, but the thing is in how they can actually start up. Uh, so that's why they actually need a lot of guidance and mentoring on how they can actually start up and, you know, going digitally and creating like an income for them. So, yeah. Thank you, Ivy. And that also introduces another topic, which is related to your speciality, Yoshiki, um, you know, finance and investment or, or actually getting mentoring as well. Um, you're involved in, in both finance and mentoring. So how do you see things there? I mean, it sounded from what, like from what you were saying that um, the Japanese are becoming more adventurous. Is, 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 are we seeing anything happening there uh, from the Japanese perspective? Yes. Yeah. Uh... 
in Japan, uh, the, the business environment is basically driven by physical contact. Uh, you have to be there exactly the time expected. And uh, the COVID has changed that uh, customs. Then uh, I feel we have more benefit in that point of view uh, so that people are not turning into digital way of doing business. And I think this is a very good trigger for Japanese to turn to that mode. And for example, I'm on the board of more than 20 companies and uh, I have used a lot of loss times to attend that. But these days people allows me to attend remotely, which is very good, for example. And also for our company, uh, we are more or less prepared for this kind of situation that uh, we are expecting people uh, move uh, by their own. Therefore, we are not micromanagement managing the company. And then uh, transferring it in a digital mode was very, very smooth. And the we are, I mean, saving the transportation time, uh, which is good. And we are even recruiting new people and trying to involve to a new team. And basically we do a new project with a few people, like uh, four to six people team. And with that small team, uh, we include one or two new peop- new members and then and they start to learn how to work with this environment. And they need to learn how to work by themselves, not to be ordered by somebody. So I think this is a very good training for young people so that they can be more independent and uh, the capability to take initiative by their own. So uh, I think this is overall good for us. And the, of course, from business side, the people in the uh, travel industries and restaurants are suffering very much. Uh, but uh, we are, our, I mean, official uh, constraint of activity is almost lifted. And we are now accepting people from uh, every country. Uh, very soon, with us starting from small numbers. So we are starting to adapt to a post-COVID environment. And there is no, uh, I mean, night crowd restrictions, for example. <laughs> so everything is free right now. So the question is how to avoid uh, by yourself uh, to avoid the environment that you will be infected. That's all on your shoulder. So uh, I think we are now going into the new uh, post-COVID uh, business environment. And if we talk about the one of our business line is to find the good startups and invest in them. And for example, in Vietnam, we are now finding startups in the IT sector. And we have been partners with the three local people They are all young entrepreneurs, and we have a joint venture in Tokyo with them and finding the good ones and to invest. And because all the borders are closed right now, we can share from the informational level, we can do the interview to the target company. But after that, our partners in the local site can closely discuss with them. So we can, in that sense, complement our uh, inability to see the management by our own eyes, but we can delegate that to the local team. So so it uh, turns out that we have uh, uh, a lot of partners in different countries, and that works very well in this kind of environment. So that's what... So that's brought up a a number of points, but I think, you know, one thing we could touch on in a moment is working in teams. A number of people mentioned effective teams, and you, many of you have got teams 
working in virtual environments. But maybe first of all, what, one thing that came out of that Yashiki was that in a way, startups are becoming more resilient. You mentioned Vietnam. They're becoming more resilient because of the COVID crisis. So they're actually those that are able to deal with the current situation are probably um, going to withstand quite a bit in the future. Um, and Lisbeth, um, maybe we could look at your topic of impact investment and, and that kind of um, change because of COVID. Is there, um, is there kind of a change as a result of um, COVID based on impact investment? Oh, she's just left. Maybe I could, yeah. Lisbeth, can you hear me? Yes, the the screen was freezing up for just a second, but okay. Um, I think I think we're good to go now. Um, yeah. So impact investing, you know, like and the role it plays in sort of like the startups becoming more resilient, right? Exactly. Um, and I think it's interesting because impact investing has sort of like been a 10 to 15 year trend, you know, like at the first decade, quite new. And then with the introduction of the SDGs, you know, like more mainstream capital really caught on to it. Um, and we've heard again a number of times earlier today, the SDGs come up. Um, and for me, impact investing and sustainable finance is sort of like the capital answer to addressing the SDGs, of course. And I think what we what we have observed is impact investors really stepping up um, in the midst of the pandemic and when it started. But not only when it started, but also now that the narrative is changing and shifting to more medium to long term, you know, like solutions around building and rebuilding economies in a more sustainable way, um, creating more resilience, etc. Uh, I think one of the very concrete opportunities that we have seen for startups and small businesses is impact investors uh, really grabbing onto a very traditional tool like trade finance and morphing that into a COVID response fund to give SMEs, you know, like the cash they need in order to survive those, you know, like three or six months that you need, just like Ben was saying, like we're always slower than we think we're going to pivot. Uh, pivoting is really hard. Um, and, and also to capture opportunities. Uh, I think maybe as a final thought, um, this pandemic has really jump-started a number of opportunities. Uh, one that we haven't mentioned yet, you know, like is around education. Uh, education yeah. has had to go completely global and digital. Uh, and, you know, like as Yoshiki was talking about, you know, like Japan moving, you know, like to online meetings, we have had uh, vice chancellors of universities in Africa uh, participating in Zoom calls and, you know, like having Zoom, you know, like conference calls. Um, so I, I think this is an opportunity where impact investors are jumping on to be able to provide the financing needed to turn it into, you know, like uh, companies and, and, and real solutions. Thank you. Um, maybe Ivy, would you like to follow on with that? So, uh, maybe in the Philippine context, um, how do you see things there? Well, I was actually listening to the speaker and regarding about education right now in the, here in the Philippines, it's actually probably one of the major problems, um, especially when they're transitioning online, since a lot of uh, Filipinos really can't afford um, going on digital, and a lot of public schools are actually not really into digitally experienced type of pe um, people. So it's truly a little bit of struggle when it comes to the ed educational part, but when it comes to the business perspective, a lot are actually um, trying to grasp um, on how they can actually, you know, uh, transition well uh, based from the currently uh, changing economy here in the Philippines. And um, as of right now, transportations are actually already going back. Um, except that, that there's actually a lot of a few major challenges where there's actually still a lot of restriction going on. Uh, when it comes to other businesses opening up um, here locally. But right now, um, promoting online is actually really essential, um, especially right we can't really predict how long this pandemic will actually last. So some say it can actually last like a year, like next year or two years from now, but we really can't tell when this 
um, pandemic will be over. So hopefully um, by that by that time, people can have the resiliency on um, they can actually adjust to you know resting and getting more work at home. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You're um, welcome. So I want to uh, thank you very much indeed for those comments. And Ben, you mentioned earlier about you know this sort of whole um, almost overwhelming choice that people have now for um, things like um, virtual events. But you're you've changed um, from sort of the in the event industry um, from being face to face into virtual, and you've still managed to really assure quality. And when we look at a platform like this, like Run the World. Um, it's now much more than just speaking together. Somebody mentioned earlier there was almost like there was virtual coffee. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about how the quality of those events is actually still managing to stay in the foreground. You know, not not so much. And we know that we can get thousands of people joining in. But what about the quality, um, and particularly in your area of event management? Is that something that you think will be assured? Um, either now or even post-COVID? How do you see that? Yeah, so thank you. The short answer, um, this is just accelerating something that was bound to happen with the event industry. So right now, and it's the similar situation that you see with telemedicine or you know online uh, education and so on. Basically, the event industry didn't like digital. It wasn't good, you know, from a business uh, model point of view compared to selling booths or stuff like that. Um, so that is just accelerating a phenomenon that was supposed to happen. Uh, and it's really crazy because we can expect that in the, by 2022, uh, around 20% of the market share will be online events. And that's insane because it was less than 5%. So in a matter of two years, you get that growth. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, and it's also good for certain areas, in particular, if you think about, you know, the sort of negative impact of, uh, physical events in terms of, uh, resources, you know, waste and, uh, and, uh, carbon, you know, dioxide, you know, emissions and so on. So overall, that's something, you know, that, uh, is what's supposed to happen. It, it can be good, but physical events are back. They are already back in a lot of regions. You know, people have done, you know, online events because of lockdown. I'm thinking in particular of China and no one is betting on online events anymore. They're just doing, you know, physical events as they did before. So I'm not saying that it wouldn't, you know, be part of the market share as I just explained, but people just want to go back to meet in person. Uh, that's granted and there's no doubt about it. And in particular, uh, and I don't know if you, you, we will have the time to touch that, touch that question afterwards, but in particular for young, new emerging companies, right? For startups. If you don't have already a network, virtual events doesn't work. I, I, right now, it doesn't work. Like I'm not saying they're not great solutions. Uh, Run the world is a great platform. They have these, uh, you know, chat roulette style, you know, networking feature. Great. If I don't have a network already, here in the middle of this maze and these new tools, I'm going to get a very bad time, you know, to get my ROI, my ROI. Uh, not saying that before it was easier. Huh? I know it's, it's tough to get, you know, things out of events, like good business and stuff like that. But it's even harder if you don't have an existing network. That's what I want to say. And, well, maybe uh, we could deal with that topic now. I mean, the networks, I think a couple of people have mentioned that in, indirectly. So how, how would you suggest, I mean, like for startups and people um, launching companies, how would you suggest yeah. um, getting over that hurdle? Yeah, yeah. So, but just to finish, you know, I'm just, I'm also positive and optimistic in terms of like platforms improving their offerings, but it's really on the event organizers to think what they are doing, how they are offering uh, this type of experience. The, the, the tool is just a tool and it won't solve, you know, uh, everything there. Um, what we see, you know, like after I just said that for um, established companies that have already a network, they can really leverage online events in terms of business development and even sales. There's a lot of uh, positive feedback. We also hear negative, but we hear, you know, companies that had a virtual booth and they were satisfied because it's a lot more targeted, it's more it's cheaper, and they get if they get leads down the line, you know, ROI positive, done. Uh, but for new companies, uh, it's a different story. For 
uh, what we call ecosystem events, which is very specific uh, maybe to the startup uh, uh, industry. So like those smaller, you know, or more localized events that would manage to attract international um, experts and mentors and so on. Thinking in Germany, a very good example of this will be an event like Pirate Summit in Korn. That is, you know, these type of events, they have a very hard time to transition to digital because the value and the magic was that it is a gateway or an introduction point for people who are new to technology or, you know, who are new startup founders. Um, another thing that is a bit more positive that I want to say quickly is that we also see that investors, and we heard from one of the panelists earlier that it's the case, that they are more open to connect with startups virtually. So that can be a very good thing for founders who are raising funds because now you can tap into a global market of investors beyond your own boundaries. So think of a startup in Vietnam uh, who can now you know, connect with investors in Japan and they don't need to go to a physical event. Right? Um, if we have founders listening to us, I want to share maybe quick uh, three quick tips. Uh, the first one is to do their homework. So normally with offline events, we estimate that you will need between two or three days of preparation per day that you actually attend the event. Same applies to online. Leverage all the networking opportunities and train yourself. Uh, there are so many options and there are different ones. Maybe, you know, you're not very familiar to how to do five minutes, you know, video chat with the cocktail hour around the world. Uh, so really, you need to go all in because if you are a startup founder, you're not doing this. Don't expect the others, you know, who are more established to be doing this. And the last one was to really make sure you you con you do consistent follow-ups, which is again something that you're supposed to be doing, you know, already with offline events. But now you be you need to be a, maybe even more cautious in terms of how you are doing it uh, without being salesy, without you know, like uh, like without being uh, like being you know smart and clever and interesting. Uh, same that you would do to on offline. Like if you're meeting someone in person. You would try to be, you know, probably uh, cautious in how you are pitching. Um, it's not because it's online that it's different, right? It's, it's, it's actually the same, but even harder. That was maybe, you know, a few uh, pointers, you know, especially Thank for you. founders in terms of how to leverage virtual events. Thank you. And maybe we could also stay with that topic, Shiki. Is that something you can identify with in Japan? Uh, some of those tips that uh, Ben mentioned. Is that something that, that you can relate to? Yes, uh, as uh, as Ben said, <coughs> the uh, to know uh, people for the first time by remote media is very very difficult, and the, therefore uh, I strongly feel these days that you need a very good introducer to uh, good networks. So uh, in that sense, we have been. Uh, trying to become a very good introducer uh, as you uh, uh, have introduced for the first time did that we will introduce uh, Japanese to foreigners and foreign people to Japanese uh, because most Japanese has a, a very big linguistic barrier for foreign people and the for Japanese they just rely on other Japanese reference so if we first become uh, uh, people who, who give credit for these companies, and then that is a strong sign for, for other people to follow. So someone has to be the first penguin to do that. <laughs> so, and the, of course, event organizer is a very important role to do that. Therefore, probably this uh, event probably is not a simple matching, but you need to understand the people who are going to introduce, and you have to use your credibility to, to introduce that to other people. So that sort of uh, uh, trust transfer of uh, that kind of thing will become important because people rely on your or judgment of that people, for example. Thank you. So trust, I think uh, that's a key key point, and. Uh, um, maybe we could now invite the audience. I'm not quite sure how many people are listening, but um, I'm going to carry on the discussion. But if anybody from the audience has any questions, they could either message them or I'm, there may be an op option to raise your hand. But if you can write any questions that you'd like to ask the panelists in the box below, there's a 
there's a chat function. I'd be happy to pass them on and moderate there. Um, so maybe we could um, move on and think about the teams. I think the team aspect is fascinating. And I think um, you've all mentioned teams in one way or another. And Ragnar, um, you, you also are in virtual teams now. H how do you really ensure uh, you know, effective teams now in this virtual environment? Is it something that um, you also can recommend? I mean, also for startups as well? Yeah, sure. Uh, we have uh, teams uh, in, in in a lot of countries, and they work on on projects. And uh, and uh, so, uh, if you give them a trust, they will reward you. Especially if they are involved in uh, in uh, like uh, we give give all of our employees options package packages. So they are involved in the company and uh, and the final goal. And actually, the uh, the pandemic and the recession, uh, like we learned in 2007 and 2008 when the credit crisis came, uh, this is a golden age for uh, for uh, startups, uh, and especially now because uh, uh, there's a saying uh, which has been my motto for 13 years, uh, fake it till you make it. And uh, this uh, today... Uh, it doesn't matter if you're talking to a, a startup founder or a, or an enterprise uh, employee; they're all in their living room talking to you. So there's no difference uh, now between between uh, the two two uh, kinds of workers. Thank you. Um, and virtual teams. I think we've we've got many uh, many of you are actually working in virtual teams. Um, Ivy, can you also comment on that in terms of your teams there in the Philippines? How does it work for you? Well, currently we're uh, transitioning online, so everything is digital. So I actually do have a team here that is here in the Philippines, and a uh, majority of them are actually working freelancing. So they have the flexibility with their time as well, but it really actually depends upon the work that they actually are working right now. So when it comes to, you know, transitioning, you know, virtually when it comes to teams, it's not really that difficult because there is actually a lot of tools where you can actually micromanage teams online instead of, you know, micromanaging them um, uh, personally. So there's actually a huge difference, but um, there's also a, an advantage when it comes to, um, getting them to transition online as well. So, so far, so good. Um, a lot are actually, are, uh, you know, starting to embrace how freelancing works. And I think majority of the businesses as well from other countries can actually do that as well, not just here in the Philippines. Thank you. And um, Lisbeth, you also, um, you're working in virtual teams. You also mentioned um, that in terms of lowering the hierarchy earlier um, in teams. Um, any kind of um, tips or, or kind of suggestions there in terms of you know high performance teams in this particular context? Um, maybe I'll try to give sort of like two or three very concrete tips. I think what we okay. have seen is that the um, the need for physical in like togetherness is mostly around the creative process and the brainstorming process. So whiteboarding and, you know, like creating something with post-it notes, you know, like on zoom, you know, like doesn't seem to, you know, like capture that all that well. Um, and as part of that sort of like effectiveness and creative process is that when you're virtual, it looks like you go very quickly into content and there is not enough room made for either creativity and brainstorming um, or for mental check-in with each other. So there is a loss of the social connection that actually builds trust between effective team members. And if you have a repeat, then it becomes too transactional and your teams no longer, you know, like relate to one another enough. So I think in addition to the virtual happy hours and the team moments that other team members were talking about before, um, being able to build in very deliberate 
moments, either throughout the workday um, or throughout interactions with your team members to bring in those two aspects. So we have sort of like this uh, traffic light system, you know, like where you kind of go like uh, time out, you know, like we need some social huddle time or, you know, like we're getting into very operational decision mode here. Can we can we do a strategic brainstorm or can we organize a brainstorm session? So just be more explicit and deliberate about it. I think that's what we have what we have felt. Um, and then we work across cultures. Uh, so cultural differences, you know, like and being able to pick up on those and be very inclusive in being respectful and not assuming um, and creating a lot of transparency around those things. I think it's been one of the lifesavers in working across. We have 10 nationalities in a team of 30 people. Um, so that's, wow. a lot of, that's a lot of United Nations altogether. <laughs> <laughs> so openness, transparency um, helps building trust. We've got uh, literally uh, 20 seconds left. Um, any final comments based on that, Ragnar, um, from your perspective, um, virtual teams? Uh, no, uh, well, we wor work with a lot of uh, virtual teams all over the world uh, using Upwork and Fiverr, and uh, it's been uh, great using these uh, small virtual teams. Wonderful. So thank you very much indeed to our panelists. I actually didn't introduce myself. I'm from Switzerland, to the University of Applied Sciences here in uh, near Zurich. So um, thank you all to our excellent contributions from our, from our panelists. I do understand we can take a selfie, which um, means if I press a button here on the screen, we can all kind of uh, smile and be in a, a shot. So um, five, four, three, two, one, off we go. So, and then anyone else who wants to take a selfie can also take one. Uh, I think there's a button on the screen somewhere for other people. <laughs> this is a new thing. Good. <laughs> So now other people are taking selfies, it's great. And I think it's mixing it up now by the look of it. And maybe we'll have a <laughs> final group picture at the end. This is something. <laughs> Not quite sure this would help in building virtual teams, but uh, <laughs> there we are. Great. I think um, we're going to get the final photo, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, well, we're missing photo. someone there. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much, panelists. Thank you very much also to our audience and wishing you all, you, or wherever you are, day or night, um, morning or afternoon, a wonderful morning, afternoon or evening. So thank you very much indeed from Switzerland, uh, from Iceland, from the Philippines, from Japan, from the UK and from France. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.